Stage, Dr. Mary Jo Kleitzer, director of the university's Earl E. Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing. Well, welcome to the well-being experience. In making the decision to host the event tonight, it was our goal to engage you in ways that would open your eyes to new possibilities, to inform you in ways that would deepen your consciousness and awareness and wisdom, and to empower you to lead from the heart in advancing well-being for yourself and the world around you. So please join me in thanking all of the sponsors, especially Sunrise Bank, exhibitors, and the Bakken staff for all they did to make this event possible. So Otto Scharmer is a professor at MIT, and he wrote the book Theory U. And in the book, he describes the moment that we are living in as a moment of profound possibility and enormous disruption. In many respects, we are standing at the edge of an abyss, and the world around us, as we've known it, is dying and disintegrating. The ground under our feet is literally shifting. Yet in the distance, we can catch a glimpse of new possibilities, new social structures, new mental models. 
But the challenge, the challenge that we all face is how do we get from where we are now, from here to there? We're facing in society today three major divides. An ecological divide, we are facing unprecedented changes due to climate change, and we risk losing nature. We also face an, an enormous social divide. There are incredible rates, embarrassing rates, obscene rates of disparity and fragmentation, resulting in a loss of society, the social whole. And we also face a spiritual divide. Millions of people experience anxiety, depression, resulting in a loss of meaning, a loss of self. In the United States, suicide is the tenth leading cause of death. So the task that we face is not small. As we think of how do we shift from an orientation of me to a focus on we. So how do we shift from an ecosystem point of view to an ecosystem um, point of view? And the challenge that we face is one of great urgency. It's really, as Martin Luther King referred to the time, as the, the fierce urgency of now. So tonight, I'm going to talk about well-being. And as I talk about well-being, I'm going to talk about personal well-being, the things that you can do in your life to improve your own well-being. And I'm also going to pivot and talk about global well-being. So the things that you can do in your life that impact the world um, beyond yourself. So the word well-being, um, when people think about it, many words come to mind. And so if I was able to create a word cloud of what was on your minds with well-being, many words might emerge. People often describe well-being as saying it's general contentment with life and the way things are, being balanced in body, mind, and spirit, being connected to purpose, people, and community, to be peaceful, energized, and confident, in control, resilient, safe. So in one word, well-being is about wholeness and being whole. A definition of well-being that I particularly like is one um, from the work of um, Dr. Atul Gawande, the physician who wrote the book Being Mortal. And he describes well-being as the very reasons that we want to be alive. So tonight I'm going to talk about what we know about the science underlying well-being, the determinants of well-being, both at a personal level um, and at a global level, beginning with the whole area of health. So what we know is that 80 to 90 percent of how healthy you are has nothing to do with health professionals, hospitals, or drugs. It has to do with lifestyle choices that you make. And that is true even into the older adult years. So what you eat, how much you move, the quality and the quantity of your sleep, and how you manage your stress and emotions, those are the big drivers of health. So in so many respects, health is literally in your hands. So taking just one area of health, what you eat, healthy eating, we know that a plant-forward diet, eating more fruits and vegetables, benefits personal health. But it also impacts planetary health. Livestock production is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gases and climate change. So what are the other impacts of what we eat? In the United States, every year, we throw out 40% of our food supply. Food waste is the single biggest occupant of American landfills. And then, 42 million in our country are food insecure, don't have enough food to eat. And that includes 13 million children and over 5 million seniors. So the second area of well-being that I want to highlight is the whole area of purpose. 
purpose and meaning in life. What gets you up in the morning? We know that purpose, often defined as aim or direction in life, for some people, they live out their purpose in their job or career, but for many people, purpose is something that goes well beyond um, their work. What we do know is that purpose matters at every age and stage of life. Purpose isn't something you figure out in your teens and 20s, and then that purpose you stay with your whole adult life. In studying adult development cycles, it's very normal for people to rethink purpose um, even every decade of their life. But what we do know is that purpose is very connected to both well-being and longevity. A study of over 6,000 people funded by the National Institute of Aging found that people who had a greater sense of purpose and direction in their life were more likely to outlive their peers. In fact, people who had a sense of purpose had a 15% lower risk of death than those who said that they were aimless. Well, purpose matters not only in our personal life, but it also matters in our organizational life when employees and leaders are aligned with a purpose and mission of a company we know there's increased engagement, increased productivity, um, things within the business work better. And that's also true in social and political movements. A shared purpose can make the impossible possible. So purpose and health are critical to well-being. The third area that I want to highlight is the whole area of relationships. As human beings, we have a deep need for connection with other human beings, um, intimacy, emotional bonds in our life. The health risks of being alone are comparable in magnitude to the risks associated with cigarette smoking, high blood pressure, and obesity. And in the United States, there is more loneliness than depression. And so in so many respects, Isolation is fatal. A third of all, all adults over the age of 45 describe themselves as being lonely. So having personal relationships is important. Our social networks are also important. Our well-being and our happiness is linked to our social networks. Um, research has found that you are happier if you're surrounded by people who are happy and in fact, that's also true of health behaviors. If you hang around people who have healthy behaviors, you're more likely um, to also have um, healthy behaviors. If we want to extend this to population um, well-being in the area of relationships, for population levels of well-being to be significantly improved, we need to address factors that contribute to low well-being, factors such as poverty, social isolation and exclusion, and unremitting stress. The next area of well-being I want to highlight is the whole area of community. And there's many ways to look at community and attributes of community. You can look at, is the community livable? You can look at things like jobs and schools and transportation, the culture, arts, green space, the level of crime. You can look at equity, fairness. Do people have access in the community? And you can also look at connectedness. So you might have lots of assets in the community, but if people are not connected, if they're not engaged, if they don't feel they're empowered, they don't benefit as much from those assets. We know that people who live in American cities with low well-being are twice as likely to have a heart attack as those that live in a city with high well-being. So community really nurtures and sustains us in many ways. Ed Diner is a researcher and scholar who's written many, many papers and published books on well-being. And he has studied well-being at the individual level and also at the level of societies. And what he writes about is that we know that a certain level of economic development is important that the needs of citizens be met and that's associated with, with well-being. But above that, wealthier countries don't necessarily have happier people or higher well-being. However, 
Societies that have the highest level of well-being have these characteristics. Strong rule of law, low rates of corruption, effective and efficient government, progressive taxation, income security programs, political freedoms, and more healthful, natural environments. So the next area of well-being is the area of safety and security. Feeling safe and feeling secure is a basic human need. People need to feel that they have enough financial resources, that they can have food on their table and a roof over their heads. Safety and preventive health measures are related to safety as well as security. We know that violence, whether it's interpersonal violence or violence in our communities, erodes a feeling of safety and security. Fear, for any reason, immobilizes us and erodes well-being. So people can have good health, they can have purpose, they can have good relationships, but if they live in fear, that really adversely impacts their well-being. But we also have to look at safety and security at the community level. Assaults on human rights pose a threat to human dignity, livelihoods, and safety. And racism, intolerance, and the lack of civility have a corrosive effect on the social fabric that binds us together. So it has an impact not only on individuals, but it has an impact on the social whole. So an important question to ask in communities these days is do people trust their neighbors, their police, and their politicians? So the last area of well-being that I want to highlight is the whole area of the environment. And with the environment, it's important that we have clean air, clean water, that we have freedom from toxins. There's more and more evidence that we have to pay attention to the built environment. So there's a whole field of evidence-based design. We know that we shape our buildings, our neighborhoods, our communities, and then they, in fact, um, shape us. So looking at the science of built environment is important. But the one I want to highlight tonight, and one that I'm sure you experienced um, in the festival that preceded um, this program, was access to nature. As humans, we're increasingly disconnected from nature. Over half of the world's population, four-fifths of Americans live in urban areas where access to nature may be limited. U.S. adults, we spend 90% of our time indoors and over 11 hours a day interacting with media, listening to, watching, reading, or in some way interacting with media. And what we do know, and there are literally thousands of studies now that connect um, nature and well-being, that when people are in nature, it reduces their stress, improves their sleep, decreases their anxiety, leads to greater happiness and life satisfaction, and reduces um, aggression. Richard Louvre um, wrote a book a number of years ago that I'm sure some of you recall. The title of the book was The Last Child in the Woods. And he coined the term nature deficit disorder. And what he found in his work is that children who are overly programmed and don't have access to nature in fact, they have a disorder that impacts their learning, their creativity, their social relationships. And then a number of years after that book came out, he published this book, The Nature Principle. And the finding was, guess what? It's not only kids that suffer, it's also adults. So nature, in many ways, heals. But I don't want to leave the area of the environment without talking about the greatest public health threat that we have faced in our lifetime, and that's climate change. So these are two headlines from reports that have come out um, in the last four to six weeks. We know that climate change impacts weather, food, disease, mental health, and it's a national security threat. It's a national security threat because it's anticipated that there'll be mass migration needed because of changes in land and land structures, as well as severe food shortages. And there are personal choices 
that people can make that can reduce their contribution to climate change. Choices from how they dry their clothes, to how they're transported, um, to the food that they, um, that they eat. So there are things we can do individually to impact, impact climate change. But what's really, I think, important for us to grasp is just like the six areas of well-being are so interrelated, the policies on energy, transportation, food systems, and urban planning, they shape climate change and they also impact human health. So it's so critical that we look at policy from a whole systems perspective. So I've t as I've talked about well-being tonight, one of the things I want you to, enc to encourage you to think about is that as you think about cultivating well-being in your life, it's not about checking a box. It's not about having each of these areas balanced. I don't actually even know what balance means completely in body, mind, and spirit. It doesn't mean that you follow a recipe or that you, you know, fill in a template. It means that you really think about what is it that matters in your life. So we know that well-being is very connected to happiness. It's also very connected to what oftentimes people refer to as the good life. Richard Leiter, a senior fellow at the center and an author extraordinaire who's written many, many books on purpose, has my favorite definition of the good life. And Richard defines the good life as living in the place you belong, with the people you love, doing the right work on purpose. So you can see it very connected back to well-being. Well, making change on a personal level is hard enough. So how do you begin to make change on a systems or on a global level? How do you begin making that shift from ego system to ecosystem? So one of the things that Otto Scharmer writes about, and Otto Scharmer is a social activist, he's a social architect, he's interested in studying movements and how do you get people to change and shift in their thinking. And he writes that the results achieved by any system is a function of the quality of awareness of the people within that system. In other words, form follows consciousness. If we want to see change, the question we should be asking ourselves is how do we create new mindsets? And so one of the most important strategies is to activate as many social fields as possible. And as we activate social fields to think of how do we increase awareness and how do we build capacity. But I think it's, it's obvious it, in these turbulent times that it's not just about reaching out to social networks of people that are like us and that we're comfortable with. So talking to people that look like us and agree with us does not necessarily help shift and create different mindsets. So the, the, the notion of it, activating as many social fields as possible means going outside our sphere of comfort. And in doing so, there's three things we need to do. One is we need to create new knowledge. And to do that, we need to cross disciplines. And we need many disciplines to solve problems. Here at the University of Minnesota, we talk about grand challenges. And you can't solve grand challenges by one discipline looking at the issue. We also need to build capacity that crosses intelligences, such as the mind, the heart, and the will. So tapping into not only IQ, but also EQ, emotional intelligence. And we need to think of how do we convene, convene innovation and innovation labs? How do we experiment in ways that cross sectors, business, government, and civil society? So that's all part of activating as many social fields as possible. And there are so many urgent areas of focus, be it health, energy, transportation, food systems, education, um, community design. I think something that is both exciting and daunting is that the most tectonic shift of our lifetime is not behind us, but it's right in front of us. And we have choices to make right now 
that impact not only our personal lives, but they impact the kind of country we want this to be, as well as the well-being of the planet. So I encourage you to sort of think back to when you were a young child on an autumn evening, lying in the grass, maybe in a pile of leaves, and gazing up at the stars above. As you were gazing at the stars, having that feeling that you were a teeny tiny speck in the universe, but also having at the same time that feeling of being deeply connected with something bigger than yourself. So the feeling of being both powerful and powerless. I think the message that I bring tonight is that you are far more powerful than you ever imagined. The changes you make can impact both your personal life and the world around you. And I love the words of Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group can change the world Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So if we can do it anywhere, we can do it here in Minnesota. Thank you very much.